And I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna get kidnapped. There is a town on in here. They just bombed us. Hi. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Ido. Ido, where are you from? I grew up in Aranana. For later, um, my parents moved to Anasharon, which is just just the other side of the road. And now I live in Bersheva down south. And uh, how old are you? 26. Why is your English so good? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like just when my teacher in, in junior school they just didn't give up. Because I remember being a bad, bad at English. But I don't know. It just it feels natural to me. Okay, yeah, yeah, you have great English. A lot of people don't have such good English. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your life before October 7th. Who, who were you as a person? What were you doing? What were you involved with? Tell me a little about October 7th, before October 7th. So I was studying, um, I, was, I'm, I am studying computer science. I'm studying at the Open University. I moved back down south to Beersheba. I used to be a guider. I used to work as a guider and I just fell in love with the city, but I didn't want to study at the university over there. I feel like it just, it closes you. It makes you, makes you to be something, forces you to be something. And I like the fact that I can move whatever I want, study whatever I want, what time I want, just my own tempo. And um, I wouldn't consider myself such a talented, talented men but very hard workers so this open university stuff is for me and what what year in the program were you in i finished first year okay okay and it's a three-year program it, it it doesn't it doesn't have years you choose how how to spread it out if you want to do it like in three years very intense or in five years very easy going i plan to do it on five now i think on uh, four now i think i'll do it in five love can you tell me about the unit that you were involved with before October 7th and about your military experience? I used to serve in Maglan. Um, it's one of the commando units. And I just was in the troop in charge of like um, special missions. Just kind of missions you don't want to be found. And I, I can't tell you more, but um, that's it. We're special forces. We're special people. Ah, we're not special people. You are special. Well, don't say that. And... Uh, October 7th happened. Where were you? What was your October 7th experience? So I was uh, waking up at my parents' house. I was sleeping at their house for uh, two weeks, not in my apartment because I dislocated my shoulder. I couldn't make myself food. I couldn't take care of myself. And so I just moved back with them for like two weeks. And so I had this um, the thing you put on your hand to carry, to carry your own hand. And then six and a half in the morning... Um, we just had alarms all over the country. We went to the safe zone. You know, kind of usual to doesn't like, you know, alarms doesn't mean like war now. You're talking about the sirens, the rock. The sirens, yeah, all over the, the red, it calls the, it's called the red color. Mm. And I just went back to sleep. And then in around nine, nine, I think, nine in the morning, um, a father wakes me up and he's like, wake up, there, there's war. There's really war outside. And from that point on, just stuck to the TV until my my team called me. And you were you were injured at this point from the shoulder? Yeah. And how did you feel? Like you're, you're at home, you're injured, you're watching the news, all this is unfolding. What emotions were you feeling while you were it's, sitting at home? It was insane. It was like watching an action movie because you just... This one's kidnapped. This is somewhere you see videos of people get kidnapped and a lot of blood, a lot of murder, and just, it doesn't feel real. I, until this day, it doesn't feel real, but back there, you're just feeling hopeless looking at the TV. Mm -hmm. You just wanted to take a gun and run over there, but truth is, everyone who really did that never got back. And that, at this time, you were in Hada Sharon. True. Okay. And, um, you, you mentioned in your, your your unit called you. You're injured. Your unit calls you when? The same day. Okay. I think they told um, reserve military to just get organized at the day, and they put the people who are in military right now to 
go to the kibbutzim down south and le- and actually uh, face the terrorists because they're more organized um, or prepared. And I just organized a bag, went to my base, and I came with Unifers in my hand and able to, to, to work in any way, to help in any way. And what was your, when you arrived to a base, they see you that you're at an injury. What, what was like the first thing that they put before you in terms of task or what were you able to do? I, I knew myself that if tomorrow we're all getting inside Gaza, I'm not coming in. I was, I, I mentally knew it because there is no way I would put at risk on my team at getting inside without being really a- able to help. I, in a way, told them that I'm not going in because I was not able in any way to be a fighter. And so you you went because you needed to be there mentally, physically, and because your unit wanted you to be there. Like why, staying, why, why didn't staying at home no? is just not enough. Yeah, and that's what I want to tell. Like, why didn't you say no? I can't come. Doesn't feel like an option. And from from the time that you were there until the time at the end of October that your your unit entered Gaza, what were you doing? So while they were training, um, just being more organic with each other, just getting their shape better, training, all those stuff we didn't do for a lot of time, like carrying out wounded people and so and so. Um, I was uh, doing nothing. I didn't do nothing. From time to time, I they realized I could help in some logistics, but not not, not big time. I couldn't carry stuff. I went out from the base uh, once a week for uh, physiotherapy at a private place. Um most of the time, nothing. Just laying down and watching them. How did that make you feel? Bad. Yeah. And I like you. You're they're preparing you for this moment, and you're doing this moment for a reason. And it has it is a value in it, and it's it's meaningful. And when it when it, when the time comes, it can help. The emotion you felt was hopeless. The emotion I felt was hopeless the moment they got in without me. That was the f- that was the worst moment. That was the end of October, and so they leave the base and they just going on buses, um, going down south, and I'm like, "Good luck, guys." No idea if this is the last time I ever see them, and knowing they're getting inside Gaza, and I'm staying here. I was in a bit better shape because I keep I keep doing physiotherapy, and then. And then I just, I was able to help more in logistics, but is a logistics, not carrying anything heavy. Um, but that was, that was the moment I felt really lost. Mm. And did it motivate you to be more focused on your physiotherapy and your re- rehabilitation because you, like, you wanted to join them? I wanted to say I had motivated because I was out of motivation and any, I didn't have any power because I felt like I needed to be there and I was feeling very hopeless, but it, I kept doing physiotherapy and, and I increased the times of doing therapy, but mentally I wasn't there. I was like, fuck, I can't believe I'm in. Mm-hmm. And so you eventually go into Gaza and join your team. Can you give me like the, the timeline from, you know, your team leaving without you to then you joining them? I think around 27, 28 of October um, is where they got in. And then there was a time where I just could move my hand freely. And just felt good and strong, and I was more helping in in the logistics. We were making the packages to go inside Gaza for them. We we're making the food. We we're we we're putting bags full of water for them, so they get it every twenty four hours and doesn't have to carry a lot of weight. Mm. And we got because we were we weren't inside. We got from a time to time like uh, like twenty four hours at home. So I got twenty four hours at home, and I went to my apartment in Beersheba, and I was. On the way to the bus, going to the central uh, of the country, to the central district for uh, meeting my nephews. Okay. And before I get to the bus, I get this uh, phone call. Right, you've got a chance to go in tonight. And I'm like, whoa. And then I go, I go back to the base. I organize base. I organize my stuff. I make sure that the equipment is uh, convenient and everything is is good on me and the um, weapon is working and it's shooting and I tried all my uh my uh magazines all my magazines yeah and uh 
I was too late to go inside. It was uh, Wednesday, and then I just got on, on first day. So, oh, so you, so Wednesday you didn't go in. Wednesday I got the call. Yeah, that was eight of November. So I went, I went inside at nine of November, and I got there in the middle of the night. I came on the bu- on on the hammer that carries the food and the water. I myself made for them. I just jumped on it. What did, you, what did you feel from that moment that you, you know, just a few hours before, the day before, where you're like, you know, hopeless, and you're doing the logistics, and then you get this call, and now you're across the border into Gaza? Well, what did you feel? It's scary and not scary at the same time. It's it's scary, not scary, and meaningful at the, all the same time, because you're in, you're literally in. This is what, oh, just what you've been heard about all these years. And but you're gonna see your team. You're gonna be together. You're all weaponed. You're all armored. If something happens, you're able to act towards it. And I remember just going and seeing the runes and whatever the runes, the runes, the runes of runes. North Gaza. And I said, and I was like, man, this place is gone forever. And seeing a lot of soldiers. And then I went to this uh, building where another team, not my team, slept. They told me, I'm not going inside as one of my team. I went to be like, um, did you of the second of the troop commander? Um, that was like the deal I could get in for. I got to the building. I, I met them. I saw them. Not my team. The people who are in my fourth, my four. And, and I went to sleep because there was no mission. And I remember people waking me up. What the fuck, Hunter? Is that you? What are you doing here? What the... Nobody told me this. Yeah. When'd you get here? Where, 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 where'd, where'd you, you get here? Where'd you come from? And, and so I have two questions. How did you feel? You know, you went to sleep, and now all of a sudden you're in Gaza, and the next day you you wake up and you're in Gaza. You're no longer in normal life. Like, well, what did that feel like? First of all, I didn't go to sleep. So many, so many noise. And I'm not used to it. The people were laughing at me that I woke up from. Everybody was deeply, deeply asleep beside the one who's in guard. Who's in guard. And they were like, uh, a newbie. <laughs> You're not used to the bombing. And then the day after, I just went to see my team. They had the same reaction. You know, what the hell are you doing? And they told them, I healed. So I came. And so we spent the day together. Just, just talking with each other. They were telling me about what happened to them, how they spent the last few weeks, about the missions they did, and that was insane to hear. But I knew that this is the kind of stuff they probably do. And um, well, what was the energy between the team when you joined them? And not necessarily about you, but like the morale at the time, because you know, it's, I want to say it's still fresh. It's two weeks into this war, or into into being in Gaza. Excuse me. Well, what was the morale when you got there? The morale was good. I think people, when you're in with your team, it's like, this is the only thing you think about. Mm-hmm. You almost don't think about this right now that you're in a mission, you're inside Gaza. Um, there's no mission right now, so people just were like, get ready for dinner. And I don't know, you feel safe and you feel good. In a way, you feel way better than being in front of the TV in Israel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so... I, I felt I felt good. I felt protected. And what was your mission when you first got in? Well, well, what did the commander tell you, for example, that your immediate mission was? The mission where I got injured, or or just the mission that when he, the day you entered, or was this just an opportunity for you to join the team and there was no mission yet? Exactly, okay. there was no mission yet, so I just spent time with them. Um. I, I notice how disconnected they are. So like one one guy from my team asked me, "Our people are still care about us in Gaza, in Israel." They're like, "TV is about, still talking about us." This is how disconnected they were. Mm-hmm. But officially, there's no mission. That's because they don't have their cell phones. They have no communication to outside of Gaza. True, true. Now, tell me, you told me you were in for 24 hours before you got injured. Class. Less than 24 hours. Okay. You, were, yeah. you were counting the, the hours. Um, you know, you're sitting here in Sheba Medical Center. How did you go from entering Gaza, 
spending less than 24 hours to sitting here? So after a few hours spending with my team, um, they were talking in the tele telecommunication, uh, how do you call that? Radios. They were talking in the radios and they said there is a mission and it's for team three. We're t my original team is team one in our trip, but for every team, the four people of the second the troop commander and the six people of the troop commander, like to, their squads joining every every mission. So for me, if for my team it meant staying at house, just being aware there there's a mission happening, for me it meant mission R. Mm -hmm. And the mission was to finding a tunnel. They said there was an important tu tunnel needs to be found. So I left, I high-fived my friends, I left, and it was uh, in the area of the mosque. And the mosque was already ruined. Where, where in Gaza is this? North, Beit Hanon. Okay. The mosque itself was already ruined, and the team was searching around the mosque, in the floor, moving leaves, moving whatever seemed uh, suspectable, but none, none to be found. And then... Um, Someone pointed out that there are, there are cables. There's a camera um, at the ceiling and offer to to follow the cables. It, it must have cables. It's not disconnected from anything. It's a camera. It's transmitting somewhere mm -hmm. and it needs to have cables. And we got inside the building where it came from. We found the cables and then we started following it take us to another building, another building. Um, um, of course, we used every every necessary means to make sure to, to, it's not bombed. Some people are experienced in that. Some people are more, some people are less. Truth, truth to be said, um, I'm not used to opening the doors at Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't let's say sharp on that point and it got us to a hole and then first room to the left tunnel tunnel cables going inside the ground and for me that was like heart pumping we literally found it mission like mission completed now we just need to get out do whatever needs to be done with this thing what does that mean do whatever needs to be done it depends on the intelligence. Sometimes you have to ruin it. Sometimes I don't know. Um, but I'm not used to that kind of adrenaline. My my military was about not being found. Um, the kind of missions I had in my military are the missions that are ruined if they find you. It needs to be very quiet. It needs to be very precise. I'm not used to this aggressive, non-clinical um missions so i was just looking at the tunnel we just wanted to make sure there's no one at the floor and inside the tunnel or no where you were where are we are the first floor the hole it, the hole mm -hmm. first room to the left there's a tunnel you keep going there's a t-section to the right you have the rest of the hall to the left you have another room so we went a bit a few steps forward um, the four of us were the first one and there's the other six um, two people went to the right to the rest of the other and I need to make sure there's no one at the room and I turn to my left I start trying to my left huge explosion I see the wall get ripped and it happened so fast I don't remember the next thing I remember I'm laying on the ground everything's a lot of dust I can move any of my left parts. I can't move my right, my right leg, and I can only move um, my, my right arm. And before I start to think about what happened, I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna get kidnapped. There is a tunnel in here. They just bombed us. And it's so intense and it's so powerful. You don't think about nothing else. You just first thing that got in my mind, it's like kidnap, that's it, I'm done. Um, I mean, first thing I think is realizing I'm alive. Second thing is I'm going to get kidnapped. And 
and and I think that was it. That was like there was just a moment when I said, "Okay, I can't move anything, so I won't move anything." I'm probably looking like a buddy. Might as well just not move anything, and maybe they'll pass on. Whatever happens, whatever will pass by you if they come up to see. Maybe I look like a body. Mm-hmm. Why move? And then it was that was the two scariest minutes of my life. And then I heard um, words in Hebrew, and they started to rescue us. And then I start like whispering whatever I called. I'm injured. Help me! I was feeling great pain in my left leg. And did you see terrorists come up and look around? My eyes were closed. I couldn't open my eyes because of the because of all, of all of the dust that mm. got out. And because of that, I didn't know how I looked like. I didn't know how the how the hall looked like. I didn't know what happened to my friends. Eyes closed, laying down. I heard this beep, great pain in the leg, and and that's it. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. And you're just inside your mind, and that's it. And then I heard Hebrew. I start whispering for them to rescue me. It didn't happen on on the moment I, I whispered, so I thought maybe someone is injured harder than me. Um, but you mostly think about the pain because the pain is like different than any other pain I felt. And adding that to adrenaline, everything, insane. Did you think you were going to die? I don't know. I don't know. I, those, those, those moments are so... So unclear and so powerful. It's not like you and me talking now. We can feel about what we're thinking, about what we're feeling. It's not that kind of a moment. It's like... Boom, and then... That's it. It all happens. It all happens. And so what happens from there? You you start whispering, you hear Hebrew. There was a moment Shana just ripping off my cloth, cloth, cloths and putting uh, the thing, you know, to stop the bleeding mm-hmm. on my leg. Um, they put in a tourniquet on my leg. And then um, he carries me somewhere. I remember someone from my team voice. And I'll be right. at this point. My eyes are still closed. I don't know how my body is acting. I don't know if it's moving. I just feel pain and I sense the things that are touching me are happening to me. I feel the pain of the turning cat in the leg. I hear the voice. I don't know where I'm laying down. down. I don't know nothing. I have no idea what happened to my friend. I'm not thinking about it because of the intensity. Mm -hmm. I had no idea at that moment what happened. And... I can tell you that they told me that they put us all in the mask and start dealing with us and treating us and they put doctors came over there. But at that moment, I had no idea. And then people carrying me, putting me in a car at the Hummer and I feel we're driving and the pain from the tourniquets gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And at one point, my eyes gets open and I see the sunset and I see the border of Gaza. I understand we're out of the through the buildings where the open area and they scream yeah border border you're going for the border inside Israel they lay me on the ground this girl talking with me to keep me in conscious airplane um hospital things I don't remember like it happening step by step I just remember the big stuff and then this this woman asked me, are you conscious? And I'm like, it's so hard for me to say even one word or send this. It's like almost impossible. And I said like, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we call your mother and you tell her you're okay. So I'm, I'm able to say like, I got injured, I'm okay. That's the last thing I remember. Black. Next thing I know, I wake up the other day. At the hospital? At the hospital. Here at Sheba or at Soroka? None of them at um, Shalit Tzedek okay. in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's quite far from... Yeah, because because Soraka is so busy from the war, you can put a lot of injured in one time that will crush them. Mm-hmm. So they had to put us in an hospital where, which is ready to take so many injured. Mm-hmm. How many people were you at the mosque that day? Ten. And how many people left the mosque? Six. The rest were killed at Bindu? Yeah. It was this, this, I, I, I was so high from the drugs, I didn't know. I didn't even think about it. And 
I remember that night, just the psychologist, they put it with me to my right and three people from my team to the left. And he's like, I'm now going to read you the list of the people who got killed. And the second he says that, like, my mind understands what happened there. And I'm like, and I'm looking at my friend, I'm like, our troop commander, right? Or like his name, his name was Moshe. And I was like, right, it was him. And then he keeps reading the names and it felt like as if it's last forever. And then I understood that some of my friends are in rooms next by me. Some of my friends in another hospital. Five of us got hardly injured. Out and one got easily injured. And out of the five who got hardly injured, I'm the only one with two legs left. Uh, what is your what is your injury? So a uh, huge obstacle just went through my leg in the upper left part of it. And it just it just smashed the nerve. I was in charge of moving my foot so I can move my foot at all. And I just got really weak. And I need to strengthen it back so I can walk properly. When were you? So you went from Sharitzadik in Jerusalem, and you, when did you move here to Sheba? I was around a week at uh, the Pulimats, and another week in the geologic department. What does the recovery journey look like for you? Um, the beginning is weird. You were driving most of the time. Gets very hard to achieve something big for the first two months. I was in a wheelchair, and people slept with me every night for the first two months because I was just afraid of going to sleep alone. Where was your family? They, they were with you. My family were with me all the time, and I asked for my friends to sleep me, mm-hmm. to sleep with me because sleeping with your family can get intense. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Time went by and I got more and more independent. I was having a hard time straightening my leg. Mm-hmm. Um, it was literally unable to be straightened. Uh, I was trying to, uh, the physiotherapist, she was literally put, told me to lay out on my stomach and just push my door, my leg down and she couldn't and it wouldn't be become straight. But now it does after, an, after another surgery I had. And um, now it. It is harder to achieve, I think, um, achievements. As the more you improve, it is harder to reach more and more normal stuff, like mm. walking properly and, and you know, just not being needed these, these things to walk with, if it's a wheelchair, wheelchair or the cob, and that's it. And you have another surgery coming up? No, I'm done with surgery. So it's a lot of rehabbing, making sure that what you're working on a lot of straining the part in my leg that needs to be straightened and wishing the part in my foot that that is disconnected from my brain will just connect itself and what do they say about that they don't it just i mean it's not like it has statistics or chances mm-hmm. chances and um how do you feel mentally now like it's been a couple months and where are you mentally you know you mentioned in the beginning it was difficult to sleep alone it's waves. What's, what's that process? Yeah. It's waves. Sometimes, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. When I'm having a good evening here with my friends, it can be a ride. You could just sit, sit alone by yourself a few hours and it's getting harder. And it's nothing like I've ever experienced. You know, you think, you think to yourself, oh, I've got 26. I've seen some stuff in life. And it's, you've got, I'm 26. I've been in the military and I, in in a, in a unit, it does like special missions, and and I thought like I've I've thought I've, I've seen it all, but I haven't seen it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a new kind of channel challenge for me. Yeah, like the the the, the mental side is as real as the the physical side. Before October seventh, did you believe that there was an opportunity for Israelis and Palestinians living in Gaza to coexist and live? I didn't know if I believed in coexistence, but I think I believed in living next to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't blame you. Yeah. And um, what do you think the future is for that kind of relationship? 
Ah, uh, I wish somebody would give me the answer for that. This is the biggest question of them all. I have no idea. And your unit, most of them has been injured, but the war is continuing. What happens, for example, when unfortunately, you know, the whole unit is taken from us or injured, but what happens to replace that? Another unit comes in, like most people don't know the military world. Right now, most of the known reserve military is working hard in Gaza and a few reserve military units. But if something you do happen, we hope it doesn't get there. And we'll be, and they call us again and we'll come in. As, as far as I know, we are called uh, in, in a few months. Just, I don't know exactly what the job is, but I don't think inside Gaza again. But this year is going to have a lot of reserve military. And do you regret going in for those 24 hours? Because we talked about it before, you were the last one in, first one out kind of guy. Do you, do you regret those 24 hours? No, I don't regret them. Um, I don't, I don't see myself, I don't see anyone guilty for, for what happened. We, we could have, we would never could know. It was a booty trap and nobody could see this coming. I was literally turning my, my weapon just to clear a room and then my life changed. But I felt so like the mental thing when becoming where I was out before I came in was the hardest I've ever experienced. Hmm. And the sense of being meaningful is way more important and just being there in my team, knowing that, that I'm helping, knowing that I'm doing something. It's, it's fulfilling. It's fulfilling. So you would go back? I would go back. Yeah. Go back and if I would be able to, if I'll be like a prop warrior, I think I would. But it's hard to tell now because there's years to think about what happened mm -hmm. and years before it will be even relevant to come back again. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, aside from Israel, well, what do you, where do you see yourself? What do you, what do you want to make of yourself? Well, I hope I'll be done with my degree in five years. I hope so. Now that it's got longer, um, I really hope so. But I always told myself that I will always have the motivation to do something if it has a meaning for me. So I'm thinking about agri-tech or sport tech, which are like stuff that I'm like and interested about. Just combining something which is useful to the community, something I find meaningful, something you can make a profit from it all at the same time. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Make the world a better place. That's the goal, eh? Thank you. A little tikkun olam. Yeah. And we all do our part. Yeah, that's about it. And uh, it's it's tough because, you know, like on one hand, like I'm sure you have this commitment to being in Israel. Do you ever think about leaving Israel? No, I think one of, one of the only good things that happened from this war is that more people, more Jews living outside of Israel understood that this is the only place it needs to be lived in. Mm -hmm. So you're not leaving? I'm not leaving. No, I'm man. I'm man for that. I'm staying here. Love that. And uh, you, you know, you you got this Barcelona flag in the, in the back. So this, yep. that's your team. It was so like, uh, well, what's your favorite team? What's your favorite sport? That's my favorite team. They're having a tough time now. Um, we're not winning. I fought after last year when we got the championship. We just get better, but it got really worse, like unexpectedly worse. But it is what it is. You don't choose your team. But you stick by them for the good and the bad. But I don't have choice. I love them too much. And who's your who's your favorite player? Well, it used to be Messi, of course. But now he moved to the United States. Yeah. You guys got all the fame. I, I kind of want to know a little bit more just about the 24 hours in Gaza. Like, I want to know more, like, like how you felt. Like, I literally, this is all I've got to feel. Yeah. Just getting in, meeting my friends, seeing them. Having fun, being called for admission, going through a few houses, looking for weaponry. What did you What did you find when you went through those houses? And we found some weapons. We found some RPGs. What do you do with the yeah. weapons and the RPGs and all the stuff when you find it? Um, you take them back. 
You take you, them with you. You take them with you. Not with you like the warriors. You take them back to, you send them back to Israel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't carry those, but you don't leave the weapon where it is. For sure. Um, and that's it. And then first mission, everything up. And I didn't get that much time to fill. You gotta do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta do it again. It's like uh, if you ever you ever play like a video game like Grand Theft Auto or something and you, you fail the mission, you click square and it's like redo the mission. I'll try it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe next week. Yeah, maybe next time. And what what's your one message to the world, to people outside of Israel, about what's happening in Israel? Um, uh, that's a tough one, but I think, think before you say there's a lot a lot of disinformation, a lot. And I've seen videos of people interviewing people who's protesting against Israel and doesn't know what they talk about. I've seen the opposite, like come here, look by yourself, feel what, what is happening here in your own eyes, see what's happening here in your own eyes, and then judge because after you'll be here, you will judge for the good. Uh, because I know Israel makes a lot of destruction in Gaza. And I know we are the stronger military and I know there is a lot of innocent dead people, but I think there was never a war so right for Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot of wars when I felt like our people are fighting for nothing. Before I was a soldier myself, are people fighting for nothing? Are people just, just, it's, it's a play of politicians and stuff like that. But now this one, this one is war fighting for. October 7th changed the game. Absolutely. And what's your message to other Israelis who have experienced similar to you? Wow. Stop honking. Stop honking. Well, as a, as a message, you know what I mean? Lord, like, literally stop honking. Just, just like this war is different than the other wars, like, I feel like we're living in a reality when there's something hard happening. So we're we're united. Everything else will turn apart. And we need to change that mentally to a place where it's not like black and white. War, we're united. Not war, we're against each other. Just getting to another type of reality where everybody's okay with each other. We're looking to... We're speaking in the language of healing and, mm-hmm. and trying to make stuff together. Because right now it feels like Every part of the party tries to bite uh, the other ones. And the Knesset, I mean. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting that you say that because I didn't want to bring it up, but I have a very hard time understanding. I mean, I, I understand it, but I have a hard time in practice understanding people who are protesting during this time. Um, are protest, protesting against, against what? They're, they're calling... Uh, for a ceasefire, they're calling for to stop the war, to change the government. You, you see it every Saturday night. And and my, my issue is that there's a system, whether you agree, left, right, up, down, I don't care. Yeah. But there's a system right now that has so much pressure on it. And we still have our brothers and sisters in Gaza fighting to, you know, keep us safe. And there's the audacity of people who are safe to go out and apply more pressure. What do you think about that? Well... I don't like this government so much as well, but I think now it's t- until everybody gets safe back, and I know it's going to take a time, and it sucks because I don't like the government as well. I think it's time to let it go. I think the government itself needs to let go of a lot of stuff and not keep making rules right now and using the situation for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, not if I, I'm not sure if what I'm saying is... is a, real in any way or it can happen but this is at least what i wish for and listen man really like thank you for your time like with this but also thank you for being so brave because a lot of people and i know this and this is a big controversy in israel um escaped their military duty a lot more people didn't but a lot of people did and you had that choice when you were injured to find your way out of not serving so, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, man.